You got it? Yeah. All right, perfect. I promise there's coffee coming. All right. Hopefully everybody's awake. No, we are waiting for the next round of coffee. I'm waiting for that myself. I don't need to introduce myself again, but I'm William. I'd like to introduce maybe Giuseppe. Nice to meet you. I'm Giuseppe. Great. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm looking for the next round of coffee is that this just happened like around 40 minutes ago. I'm pretty sure that those should be shared and not individual pizza <laughs> sizes, but we do what we can, right? But uh, it was really good. But let's dive in and let's start talking about Service Mesh. I'm sure that a lot of you are very curious about this team. I heard already from some customers that they are looking forward to run a Service Mesh in, in Fordo and 311 and whatnot. Uh, we'll dive into that. But for, for some of you that are, I would say, learning about this topic now, I'll do a kind of a quick uh, brief introduction about what Service Mesh actually is about and whatnot. So we, we, we heard, uh, for example, of, uh, on the previous talk about like, all those different microservices that they were implementing. And you, you pretty much end up with, a, with an architecture that looks like this, where all the services, some way, somehow, they start to, to talk to each other. You are building this kind of complex distributed system on top of another distributed system that is Kubernetes, right? And there are some complexities to that. As we uh, started this journey to talk about microservices, you, you pretty much think about those services in a way that I'm just going to write my business logic. But then very quickly you say, well, maybe I want some way to configure all those different services in a concise way. So I'm going to add configuration, like another trait to that particular service. Then you're like, well, maybe I need something to do service discovery because now I have like so many services, I, I need to add that other cap capability to the microservice. And then you start adding all these capacities, all these features, and your, your microservice becomes like not that micro anymore, right? It starts to grow in complexity and you kind of end up with this microservice and like if you're doing it in Java, you have like five, ten other jar files that you have to add and all the different frameworks you have to pull up, right? And that was like, I would say, very 2014. And again, it was very uh, programming language specific as well. But as things evolved, we, we started to look into like service meshes and how we could delegate some of these concerns that we think they are more uh, infrastructure related to the infrastructure, which is where they, they actually belong. So that's pretty much how we came up with this uh, thing in the industry about the service meshes. But how does that magic actually work, right? Uh, so there is no magic. I mean, it's inside of your uh, pod. So again, like quick 101 here, you have a pod. Inside that pod, you can have one or more containers. And we have this idea of a special kind of container called a, a sidecar. And this sidecar is something that can be injected automatically in runtime, so added to that pod. And then we started to implement some of those services that I was discussing before on the microservice uh, slide to that sidecar, right? In a way that it's managed by the infrastructure. And again, if something happens or you need to add another uh, uh, feature to that particular sidecar, that can be added there without actually changing the source code of your service. Uh, when you look at the, the whole architecture of, of uh, all these different things, you, you get like the, the control plane, which is uh, where a lot of the infrastructure for a service mesh like Istio, for example, uh, is. So you have Jaeger, Pilot, Mixer, and of course the uh, authentication itself. A and you have the, the, the sidecar proxies that are injected into every single pod, and they start to receive the, the policies, the configuration values from that control plane. So again, like now you can say, hey, maybe I want to add uh, mutual TLS to all my microservices. Great, you go there, you change something in the control plane. The control plane will then propagate that configuration to all your microservices. Maybe you want to add a specific like routing policy or uh, uh, some kind of uh, retry configuration that you want to apply to all your microservices as well. Again, you add that to the control plane, the control plane propagate that to all your microservices. You don't actually have to do that yourself, changing your microservice for that particular capability. But this, I would say, takes us to 
what we are calling, uh, as a product, OpenShift Service Mesh. So Istio is, is one of the components, but with OpenShift Service Mesh, we are, uh, of course, Istio is at the core, but we are packaging other technologies and distributing all those different technologies as a single operator that you can install on the platform. Those technologies are Jaeger, Kiali. Kiali is a visualization tool, and I have more slides on that later. Uh, you have Grafana and Prometheus for monitoring and visualization of the monitoring as well. And then Jaeger, of course, for, for tracing. But this, this whole package is what you get when you install OpenShift Service Mesh. It's not only Istio. So in this uh, picture, for example, this is what uh, Kiali looks like. So this is a representation of, for example, in this case, uh, three microservices. So you have one here called uh, product page, so it's a, web, it's a web app. You have a reviews service, and then you have a rating services. And this data here is captured uh, through the actual uh, traffic that is happening between those applications. So Kiali is generating this using live network data. And even the lines here, the colors and the status code that you see, those are also live, like for example, if the communication between the product page and the reviews microservice is bad for some reason, that line would be red, and you would start to see the status code changing there. So it's kind of a nice way to visualize like all this sprawl of microservices that you might have as part of your application. Uh, one nice thing also that you can see here is the latency between the communication of those services. For example, maybe you, you have like three different versions of your review service. So you just shipped a new version with, let's say, V3, and you start to notice some latency now that you roll out that version. From this same view, you can add weights to those uh, lines, to, to the graph, and then you can see that for that particular call, the latency is higher than for the previous version. So now you have a regression, and you have to decide how to address that. Again, because you are using the service mesh, you can pretty much reshape the traffic and send everything to V2 and to V1 while you're fixing V3, and you're probably going to release a new version of V4 with the actual fix to improve the latency of that service. But this is like a very, I'd say, canonical e example of what you can do with the service mesh, and again, how Kiali helps with that. Uh, another thing that you can see is like a, a, a convenient way to see like details about a specific service. Again, in this case, you get like information about the IP addresses, like the internal IPs, and also what the inbound and outbound metrics for that particular service uh, looks like. You get, of course, the, the status and all the different endpoints that are hitting this particular app. This is a very common problem as well when you have multiple microservices. You are usually like not aware of who is actually consuming your service. You're like, maybe I just roll out a new version here. I'm not impacting that other app here, right there. And you actually are. From here, you can kind of see like all the different endpoints that are uh, either using or being consumed by, by this particular service, too. Uh, another uh, very interesting feature here is the uh, configuration of the, the traffic using weights. So again, it's very common to do some kind of traffic balancing uh, using, uh, for example, either the header or round robbing or something like that. Here, you can specify some weights and say that, for example, V2 is the most stable version of this particular microservice. So I want to send 80% of the traffic to that version. And while I'm doing that, I'm still keeping a very old version around because for some reason, again, I may have to keep that around for an old legacy application that needs to consume that or something like that. But I'm starting to roll out a new version, and that new version is already receiving 15% of the traffic. If you want to change that, again, this is a configuration that you do. You can do at Kiali, or you can apply some YAML if you want to. But again, it's something that you don't have to actually change your source code or anything like that in order to roll out this change. You also have some other uh, capabilities, like, of course, adding uh, TLS and adding a, a gateway also from, from Kiali. Like, this is a new feature coming uh, that is also available now in, the, in Service Mesh. Uh, so when you add all these different components to an architecture diagram, I mean, you have something like this, at least the high-level architecture diagram, where, of course, you have infrastructure and you have uh, OpenShift itself. But on top of it, you have 
uh, a service mesh handling the traffic for all the different services that you have in any kind of application. This is something that is also very, very important because quite often the solutions that you embed in your microservice, they are uh, specific to a given programming language. So you have like a lot of frameworks that can do certain things for Java or only for Go or only for Python. The nice thing about the mesh is that it's pretty much language agnostic. You can apply that to any application that is running. Uh, and that's pretty much the summary of the, the service mesh uh, side. I think one thing that I forgot to mention here that is critical and super important is that service mesh is GA in 4.2. We announced the GA uh, last week. Uh, this is something that, again, like we have many, many customers asking us for this GA for uh, quite a while, so I'm pretty happy that uh, we're making that available now. And uh, please give it a try. Again, it's available on Operator Hub. Uh, if you have an OpenShift 4 cluster running, you can pretty much go there, click Install, and you get a complete service mesh with all these different software uh, connected and pre-installed uh, for you. Uh, now I will transition to serverless, but Giuseppe will do the introduction for that. Thank you, William. Very interesting. As, as we are going to see, uh, actually, the service mesh is one of the ingredients, is one of the components under the hood in the world serverless strategy of OpenShift product. So first things first, many of you, when we think about uh, serverless and AWS Lambda, uh, this is what it comes to mind. So it's just glorified CGI bin. Well, it's, it's actually not. But if you think about it, the, 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 the thinking behind that is more or less the same. You spin up a process, you take some event, and then you put out some, some output, of course. Uh, we did better than CGI bin because we are working on security, we are working on scalability and visibility on the stuff, but the concept is pretty much the same. It's, it's, it's not something pretty new in terms of uh, concept, and indeed. So this is the conceptual model behind serverless, of course, many of you already know. So there is a, an event flowing, then there is a, a function, but we will see that it's not just a function processing this event, processing the payload you are going to put, and then you're going to do the result. The advantage of this, model, of this model is pretty obvious. It will spin up your computational power only when you need it. So you're going to save resources. You're going to optimize your workload. So it's pretty much interesting in many kind of use cases. I'm not going to do the, 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 the full list. But of course, if you are going to have some kind of uh, variable workload like dispatching file or uh, basically all the kind of uh, application that does nothing for 80% of the time and then have a, a work pick, of course. This is something that fits very bad, very good into the, the serverless scenario. And as I was saying, actually, there is a bit of confusion between serverless and function as a service. Uh, actually, serverless as a concept is broader than, than uh, uh, the function as a service. Saying that FAS, so function as a service, is serverless is more like saying that a square is a rectangle. So yes, probably there is some relationship, but it's not complete. And this is also true um, talking about microservices and containers, because we will see that Knative will provide you a broad ecosystem of building blocks in which you can run in a serverless mode many different kinds of workloads. So not necessarily a function or a container or a microservice, but can be uh, something uh, very extended. It can be uh, pretty much everything that runs on Kubernetes. This is the serverless map of CNCF. So this map, all the things needed for, for doing serverless. Uh, many of you may recognize the AWS Lambda or the Azure Functions logo. And that is a broad picture of uh, tools and products both on the cloud or on-premise for doing serverless and for doing specific things like function as a service, as we were saying. But let's, let's have a look at the, the broader picture. So in order to do a modern application, a, a serverless application, uh, you need a lot of different things and topics and concepts. So starting from, from the very bottom, you will need an infrastructure. You will need to provision the computational power. You will need to schedule your workload. Then going up to, to uh, the next step, you will need some kind of traffic routing and uh, network resiliency. And of course, uh, as many of you can think about, this is what we are going to do with Istio. Uh, then you need some support on, in terms of uh, DevOps tool chain, as many of, you, uh, many of us, they call it. So uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, GitOps, uh, 
uh, you will need some kind of event orchestration in order to complete your building blocks. And then on top of that, you will have your own, uh, uh, basically, development pattern, so the, the, the application by itself. So zooming out on the CNCF landscape, here we'll see the full landscape. So, so not just the serverless stuff, but all the Cloud Native Computing Foundation components. And if you try to map this concept into implementation in CNCF uh, fully landscape, you will see that there is more or less a one-to-one -one relationship. And so this is what Red Hat see as a, a full stack implementation of all those concepts. So for the provisioning, for the infrastructure uh, of things running behind the scenes, of course, Kubernetes is the uh, underlying foundation for everything. Then in terms of traffic routing and security and network resiliency and circuit breaker and all that kind of stuff, Istio, as we were saying, so the service mesh is a, a very important uh, point. Then for the part of the uh, support of the whole DevOps toolchain, and in particular um, pipelines, uh, we are going to see some more details about this project. You will see the uh, cool logo with the cat. The project is called Tecton, and it used to be part of Knative, but we will see it in a bit. On top of that, uh, other building blocks for doing uh, the typical uh, uh, features of a serverless application, so uh, the scale down to zero and the spin up of new containers, and Knative is providing you all the building blocks for doing that. And of course, on top of that, you will choose your own uh, pattern and language and container to run. Uh, in our view, an important role will be uh, done by Quarkus. You, many of you will recognize the Quarkus logo and Camel. Uh, there is no time today to talk about Camel and Quarkus, but we have very, very interesting projects going uh, in, the, in the community like Camel K that uh, will fit very, very well into a serverless architecture. This is the whole picture. I would like to highlight that uh, from an infrastructure point of view, of course, Kubernetes, the OpenShift service mesh. An interesting logo to, to take into account is Keda. It's a project for running the Azure function on-prem, so you will have your Azure function, you will write it, you can uh, run it on the cloud, and you can run it on-prem if you want to, because it's mediated by OpenShift. On top of that, as, as you see, you may choose your own uh, language, so you will see the Azure function logo, but it may be Java, maybe Go, we are working on cloud functions, so our own uh, open specification of functions. And of course, another important point, uh, we, we, we were uh, uh, looking at that in the, in the first uh, a slide, basically, is the eventing part. So a very important topic of the KNED event of the serverless architecture is having some events that will trigger, uh, basically, uh, actions to the rest of the platform. And an important point here is the operator hub, because you will see that uh, by using operator, you can plug your own uh, things into the eventing infrastructure of KNED. Those are the principles of the architecture, so it has to be distributed. API-centric, uh, born to be multi-cloud, uh, meaning public cloud and private clouds, scalable by design, secure, event-driven, disposable, and polyglot. So very, very uh, way further than CGI, CGI bin. So we are, we are doing better. But I will hand it over to, to William, that is probably uh, the most important person in the Knative community <laughs> at Red Hat, so. No, <laughs> definitely not, but uh, thanks. Uh, the <laughs> The, 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 that, that was very nice, by the way, the way you, you delivered those slides. Uh, thank you for doing that. That was pretty good. Uh, looking a little bit at the Knative project, and again, if you've never heard about Knative, I'll talk more about that uh, in a bit. But I think the first thing that we like to highlight is all the members of that community and how they pretty much stack compared to contributions. And there's a link there. You can get a more updated uh, chart for that. But today, you can see that like a lot of the, let's say, most of the interesting companies doing serverless nowadays, like they're looking at Knative as like a way to, to concentrate and centralize like their efforts, especially if they're of course targeting uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it's very interesting to see uh, again, some names here that you would not think they would be uh, considering like investing resources in like building a, a serverless framework. But again, you can see by the number of contributions that they are. And diving then into Knative and explaining what it is, again, like. As, as it was said already, like Knative started with, uh, I'd say, three modules, but one of the modules was build, 
and build uh, evolves into pipelines, and then pipelines evolved into its own project, which is uh, uh, Tecton, right? And now it lives in, under its own foundation, including. But with Knative now, then it was left serving and eventing. Serving is uh, the, the, the module responsible for uh, the auto-scaling part, and it's also where, for example, we integrate, we plug in a service mesh or Istio, and that's how you can get uh, some of the same benefits from the service mesh into your serverless applications as well. And the other module here is, of course, eventing, because again, like you have those applications, you can serve them and whatnot, but the most important thing here as well is how you're going to receive events, and those events are going to be sent to those applications. Uh, I'll dive into a bit more details of those uh, modules as well. Uh, today, in an OpenShift 4 cluster, you have the community operators for those things. So you see the Knative eventing and the Knative serving operator. That's pretty much packaging the upstream bits and shipping them uh, in OpenShift. And we have the OpenShift serverless operator, which is the actual productized uh, version of those same operators that actually uh, uh, includes eventing and serving as things that you can install through a single operator. So kind of following a similar model that you saw from uh, a service mesh. Uh, looking at the user experience, uh, there is also a, a CLI that is coming from uh, upstream, so it's called KN. And using the CLI, uh, the way you can deploy a serverless application, it's very straightforward. Again, KN service create, you pass an image, and there you go. And as, as, as params for that particular uh, uh, command, you can specify, let's say, the number of instances that you want running, like maybe you want to limit to 10 or to 100. Uh, you can change the concurrency settings of that application as well. This is something that is very different compared to, I'd say, the more traditional FAS uh, model that you see in other uh, providers, because usually the FAS model is like a one-to-one -one relationship. You have one request, you have one instance of that thing running. You have two requests, you have two instances of that thing running. Here, you have a little bit more flexibility that, for example, for, for a completely stateless application that you're just serving something, let's say like a web app, maybe you can tweak that a little bit and say, I want to run uh, 10 requests or 100 requests for a, one instance of that container. And then only if I go beyond that concurrency level, I'm going to start a new container. That can save a lot of like, uh, resources and like, be very efficient depending on the workload that you have. Uh, and I think that's something that is really, really powerful. Uh, you can also, of course, then provide limits for resource consumption, so CPU or memory as well. And doing all those things from this command is, is something that, like, as someone that might be getting started with Kubernetes, I'd say it's a very intuitive uh, easy to use experience again, like in order to achieve something similar to this in, I would say, vanilla Kubernetes, like you'd probably have to be changing three or four different YAML files, learning a little bit more about all these constructs in Kubernetes that are, I'd say, they have their own learning curve. This, I'd say, streamlines a little bit that experience and put that together in a way that it, it, it makes more sense, I would say, from a developer perspective that is just starting with this, with this project. If you if we put like side by side a comparison of uh, uh, Kubernetes deployment and uh, Knative deployment, right, the YAMLs for, that are generated from from the CLI, for example, you'd get something like this. Uh, on the left here, of course, you have Kubernetes where you have the deployment description, and then you have your route, and then you have your service, and you are specifying certain things here, and you end up with about like 53 lines of YAML. On the other hand, you have a Knative description of the same service with like half, almost half of the lines, and more functionalities. Because again, with that one, you are also consuming the bits from Istio, for example, if you want to, and you're also getting the auto-scaling capabilities that you don't have on this side in the same way. So it's actually delivering like, you're writing less, and you are, say, getting uh, much, much more. Uh, the other interesting thing here is how you can pretty much get your applications that are deployed today in Kubernetes, and you can migrate them to that model without changing anything in your code. Like this, this application here specifically, is a, it's a container that was built. We joke about it when we do this demo that it's like an application from 2000s that is just like a front end, like a guest book app built in PHP. And now we're, I'm migrating that app to a serverless app without changing a single line of code or even rebuilding the container, right? Just by changing the way I'm deploying that. 
looking a little bit at the, the roadmap, right? Uh, so we are about here. We just announced uh, this week, actually, our tech preview. So the tech preview is available in OpenShift 4.1 and 4.2. Uh, we have shipped many developer previews. So like for very select customers that were already working with us, interested in this technology, they had access to the developer preview. And now we're going for the tech preview. Um, we intend to ship another tech preview uh, still this year, and then we have plans to, to take uh, Knative, at least the serving bits, to, uh, to a GA state, either by the end of the year or next year. Again, like we are working with those communities upstream. Uh, again, as you saw, there's a lot of company, like there's, there are a lot of companies uh, collaborating in that project. As you might imagine, sometimes we get into some disagreements about how API is gonna look like and what's the signature, and we spend months and months debating how we're gonna call some object. Uh, so that can delay, but uh, we're pretty confident, at least for serving, we are in a good state that like, we are all agreeing on. This is solid and, and stable enough to consider a GA product. So we had prepared a demo and we have a video here for the demo because we're concerned a little bit about the connectivity. I'll play the, the demo in a bit, but just to set the context for the demo, uh, you imagine that you have like, I'm not sure of how popular this is here, but I've seen the, the increased use of QR codes for many things. I probably saw that in the airports and whatnot, but for, for shopping as well, I mean, you pretty much go to a kiosk, you scan your product, you press a button, you get a QR code, you pull up your phone, you scan the QR code, you press pay, done, paid, right? You're done, you have, you, I'm, I joke that it's a serverless, cashless payment system, right? Uh, and this is like increasing in, in popularity, and it, I'd say it's a very uh, uh, interesting use case for serverless, because again, like, what's the scale for this system? Like, imagine that you have like multiple stores, you have the back end for this system running, like you have no idea if you have 10 people going to the supermarket or like, 100 people, like, oh, when, when is this spike going to happen and how much you actually need from the infrastructure perspective to run this kind of application. So what we did is we pretty much broke this into two, three different uh, microservices, Knative services in this case, and they are running as serverless workloads. And then we are deploying the QR code generator one representing the kiosk, a mobile app that is going to read the QR code, and then the other payment service that in this case is going to reach out to a, a, a third-party system called Stripe. It's a payment service, very popular in the US, that is going to actually get your uh, information and effectively process the payment. Uh, yeah, those are the different apps. And let me see if I can play the demo here. This is running in an OpenShift 4.2 cluster, right? Let me pause right there. So the first thing here is that KN service create that I mentioned before. I'm setting here uh, already some uh, memory uh, limits. So for example, I'm requesting only 100 megabytes of memory for this pod because it's small enough. Again, it's very limited. Again, if you think about the fast model, this kind of, it, it almost behaves like a function even though it's not a function. It's a full-fledged microservice, it's a full-fledged app. And as the service is created and deployed, Behind the scenes, you see the uh, developer console in OpenShift 4.2 creating, sp spinning up that, that service, right? You click on that link, you go to the route or to the URL for that service, you see the QR code generated. I'm just going to like, generate a new one uh, live, because again, this is a video, right? But you hit enter and you get like, a different QR code. If I change, you can't see, right? You can't read QR codes very easily, I guess. But <laughs> it is a different code, trust me. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna save that for now, because again, I'm gonna use that later to uh, upload to the mobile app. And now I'll deploy that mobile app. Let's see, great. So now I'm creating the payment service, so that's the one responsible to actually talk to Stripe, again, the 30 party company offering the payment system. Again, very similar thing, nothing special about that one. And I'm creating the, the payments, the, the, the store application that in this case here has a connection to the payment service. I'm just passing that as an environment variable because again, that allows me to change that application or the endpoint whenever I need without changing my source code for that. You see the other service coming up behind the scenes in the developer console. 
fast forward a bit. The route is being provisioned. That's my beautiful web app. Again, very straightforward. I'm going now to uh, pick up a QR code, press pay, and payments being processed. So now it's actually making a connection to, uh, to the payment system, and the payment system is reaching out to the QR code. And then here you have like an order number, the amount that I was processed, and you pretty much got the idea. Then I'm just going to repeat that same flow with a different QR code just to illustrate that again, like this is an actual live application running. I'm going to skip forward here so we are right on time. Uh, there you go. Process a different value now. Now, what I will do is just to illustrate another feature of the uh, developer console as well. This is a way for you to import a project from Git. Again, it can be any project. In this case, I'm picking up like even a Heroku example. Again, there's nothing special about the application in this case. It's a Node.js app. And then as part of the developer console, I can specify that this application is going to be a serverless application. So by just using that checkbox, behind the scenes, the system is doing all the heavy lifting to say, oh, you don't want to do a Kubernetes deployment. You want to actually deploy a Knative service. And in this case, because I'm starting from Git, I'm actually going to uh, build the application as well. Uh, using the, the web interface, again, those same params from the CLI, they are available, and you can tweak how that application is going to scale using the UI as well, if you want. Uh, again, memory settings, CPU consumption, and whatnot. When you hit Create, you get a new build triggered. And behind the scenes, you see a new build being triggered, containers being uh, created, the source code is being cloned. Uh, meanwhile, you can see that uh, the previous application that I deployed, because it's been idle for a while, it, it's already scaled down to zero. And the build is still running, right? So like, let's let, let the build run. Now I'm just going to fire like a, a performance like testing thing just to show you how the service is going to scale. And just by hitting that URL, so I'm sending 10 concurrent requests with 10 threads to that service. You see the pods automatically scaling to uh, react to that uh, concurrency or to that uh, number of requests that I'm sending. In this case, even though I'm sending 10 concurrent requests to, with, with 10 threads each, the system was uh, smart enough to understand that it can uh, uh, respond to those events by just using like nine containers or nine, nine pods, right? Instead of just going to 10 directly. And while that's happening, you also see that it's going to automatically, behind the scenes, right, auto scale down. And you see that that previous build that I triggered just finished and a new application is being provisioned again. Oh, at the same time, let me fast forward a bit. Now, again, the benchmark was done, like the test ran. You see that it's going to scale back down. It's scaled out to zero again. And last but not least, that build was complete. You see the status of the build here. The Node.js app is uh, being created. And I'll just hit the URL, and there you go. You have your Node.js app deployed as well. Nothing as fancy about that. But this was, again, like just one example of let me just pause here very quickly. Using the dev console, again, you can see the representation of a live application. You see that blue circle around what we call a donut. Uh, not my idea to call it that. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, uh, the other uh, donuts uh, empty, right? Because again, the service already scaled down to zero, so we don't have that donut running. And that particular one, that dark blue, it represents that there is something happening right now, so it's going to be like either scaling down or scaling up at this exact moment. All right. So, like I described, that, that same user experience that I demonstrated using import from Git uh, to create a serverless app, it's available for other flows as well. So you can do that to deploy a new image, for example, that you may have already built some way, somehow, or to create a new app. Like, those workflows are all embedded in the developer console. How are we doing on time? Okay, perfect. So to summarize, 
Uh, when we talk about OpenShift, of course, the first thing we think is Kubernetes, and of course, that's one very important core component of what we have. But there are many other services, many other add-ons that we are adding on top of the platform that I would say like deliver the, the full, complete picture here. In this particular talk, of course, I explained OpenShift serverless, but you have other things such as OpenShift pipelines that's based on Tecton, OpenShift service mesh that's based in Istio or SMI as well, uh, the, the OpenShift console, and you have like all these different services that are what we call like part of the core platform, like specifically targeting Kubernetes, and you have these things on top of it that you can add as operators as well. Also, uh, in, in, in my previous talk, I also mentioned a little bit of, uh, about OCM, OpenShift Cluster Manager, and again, you can see like the whole picture, like using this, you can deploy on any cloud provider. Uh, let's talk briefly also about uh, Azure Functions and CADA. This is a very interesting project that we did in partnership with Microsoft. And this is a way for you to run Azure Functions on top of uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift. Uh, it's, the source code is available there. There are like a bunch of tutorials that allows you to uh, get started very quickly. Uh, the idea is to uh, use CADA and use this as a complement to the stuff that we are doing with Knative. So for example, maybe you want to consume an event source that is available in Azure, so Azure queues or something like that. That's one event source, for example, that is not available today in Knative. You can do that using Kada. But also, you may not want to just deploy a microservice. You may want to deploy a function. You can create a function using Azure Functions. Last but not least, just to summarize, again, OpenShift serverless. It's very familiar to a uh, Kubernetes developer, to a Kubernetes user. It feels very native because, again, those are CRDs just extending Kubernetes. Uh, it allows you to scale up and down, as you saw in the demo. Uh, and of course, it can run pretty much any containerized workload. It's not only for functions because, again, as Giuseppe said, uh, serverless is more than that. It's a trait that you can apply to a variety of workloads that you might have, and I would not uh, be happy to go to like all the customers that I, that I advocated for microservices for, for many, many years say, you know what, now you have to rewrite everything as a function in order to leverage serverless. Like that, that's, that's nonsense. This is something that I would say kind of proves that and works much better. Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, go to the product page. The documentation is already there for our tech review. Please give it a try and provide us feedback. And there is also a link for the tutorial that it would walk you through, through all the steps to get started, learn about serving, about eventing, creating an application, doing revisions, versioning, and whatnot. When shameless self-promo, basically. Shameless self-promo for us. Red Hat Open Source Day is coming, uh, end of November, beginning of December. Please join us if you want to know more about Knative with live demo and so on. So we're waiting for you. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was a great. Thank you.